Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our CBD webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. We are glad to inform you that each participant of the CBD webinar will be receiving an e-certificate for their participation. Please stay with us until the end of the session and we'll be releasing the link in the chat box. To avoid any interactions during this lecture, kindly mute your microphone and turn off your camera and you can use a chat box to clear your doubts at the end of the session. Let's move on to today's topic, initial management in trauma. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. H.R. Kambabita, consultant general surgeon, currently attached to accident service of National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. We'll uh, start with the topic. And uh, if you have any doubts, uh, you can clear at the end as informed earlier. So you all can see my screen. In, that is initial management of trauma. Trauma, every day we, we face a minute amount of trauma to a, a certain degree of trauma, which can kill us or which can uh, disable us. So I will uh, go ahead with the patient whom we have received very recently, two, three days back to the accident service. He is a 35-year-old motorbike rider, knocked down by a lorry, it's a high-velocity injury. Brought to the NHSL accident service within 20 minutes. It's very, very quickly he was there, but no eyewitnesses what has happened, police brought him. He groans in pain, breathes with difficulty, but moves all four lips. His pulse rate is 36, uh, sorry, pulse rate is 120, respiratory rate is 36, blood pressure is 8 by 40. There's a bleeding wound over his left iliac fossa and his uh, left thigh was sore. So this is the picture when he came to the R room of the a &E. Now take a few seconds and think with this previous scenario, how you are going to manage this patient. If you are the attending house officer or the MO uh, receiving this patient. So while you are thinking, I will go through quickly importance of trauma. Why we talk about trauma? Because uh, in the worldwide, there's more than 5 million deaths per year. And more than that, the disability, which is more than 50 million permanent disability. And 12% of world disease burden is due to trauma. And more than that, the problem is leading cause of death in the younger, healthier people. So 1 to 44 is usually you don't get any other illness to cause death. But in this category, the trauma is the leading cause. That means the who, whoever in his prime age will be taken away from us due to trauma. And more importantly, even though these uh, data are Western data, 80% uh, in low and middle income countries. This is the graphical uh, picture of uh, categorization of trauma. So majority will take by the road traffic injuries, but uh, the poisoning, self-inflicted uh, violence uh, and occupational hazards are also playing a major role. So how a trauma kill a person? There are, this is a trimodal death distribution in trauma. So as soon as uh, somebody subjected to trauma, a, a peak of uh, deaths occur immediately. We call that immediate deaths. So this that's within this period. Then comes the early deaths. Then come the late deaths. So this trimodal uh, distribution is there, and we have to understand what are the cause, what are the causes behind these uh, deaths to prevent them. <coughs> So first peak occurs within seconds to minutes. So at, as soon as you injure that 
that uh, the patients succumb to these injuries severe brain injury high spinal cord injury rupture of heart damage to major blood vessels or uh, ivc and svc actually uh, these injuries are not uh, compatible with life usually the first two because they uh, cut off the respiratory center so then there's no way the respiration <coughs> can be maintained and rupture of heart of course uh, we can't do much because the rapid loss of blood uh, in a very quick time as well as damage to <coughs> major blood vessels uh, so the people who succumb to these injuries uh, they die on the spot or on arrival to the hospital even within 5 10 minutes they die unless they, this happens in the inside the hospital very difficult to save them uh, with these injuries but our main focus is on the second peak and the third peak the second peak occurs minutes to few hours which we call the golden hour so this is the place where uh, we can act and prevent it and our timely action actually uh, is rewarded by saving the patient so what are the causes which uh, leads to death in this uh, second peak pneumothorax including tension pneumothorax and the massive hemothorax liver spleen injuries intra abdominal bleeding pelvic fractures retroperitoneal hemorrhage the subdural and epidural hematomas that is intracranial hematomas expanding and the multiple other injuries which significant with significant blood loss so the main emphasis on this category is that apart from uh, chest pneumothorax all the others are related to blood it's bleeding so if we consider that any patient who is admitted following trauma with the hypotension until proven otherwise it is due to blood loss so that is one statement uh, we have to remember throughout our life as medical uh, personnel in dealing with trauma the third peak it it's actually delayed it's days to weeks so we have enough time to prevent but what happens is that our actions during the first and second phase if patient survives will leads to the complication in the third peak so pneumonia acute renal failure uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome sepsis fat embolism dvt the multi organ dysfunction so this this collectively affect a patient so actually some of these if we act quickly like acute renal failure if we resuscitate well we can prevent and if you start uh, chest pcu early we can prevent pneumonia so like that uh, actually it's our actions or inaction rather which leads to the deaths in the third peak but this is a, almost a controlled period where we have enough time to think enough time to investigate and uh, treat the patient so let let us go back to this patient so this patient quickly admitted to the hospital uh, and on admission since his uh, his groans and his saturation was dropping so we had to intubate and ventilate lucky he brought to the nhsl where all the facilities are there but in another center obviously you have to hand ventilate or ambu uh, even with the ventilation his saturation didn't pick up so we had to put <coughs> bilateral ic tubes as soon as we entered the uh, plural space we we felt that the gush of air coming out and iv access was secured with two large cannulas and uh, saline rapidly infused uh, one liter and since his blood pressure is still dropping uh, we had to give one cos match group specific blood uh, one pint given and another pint was on the way and at the end of this quick uh, management or resuscitation 
His respiratory rate has gone down to 30 from 36 earlier and pulse rate is still rising uh, from 120 to 140 and blood pressure is still dropping with this amount of blood and the fluid. So it's 80 by 40 earlier, now it has dropped uh, by 10, the ball. And the saturation is fairly good with, with uh, SpO2 96 and he's intubated and he's on ventilator. So this patient and this management, I think when you think of this patient, there are several uh, management protocols would have occurred to you and I. How do I manage this patient? But if a patient comes to you like this, there should be only one way of management in trauma. So how this one way of management now we call is uh, advanced trauma life support or the ATLS, how this evolved. Uh, there's a good story behind this uh, ATLS protocol. This is the picture of Nebraska. It's a state in USA in 1976. An orthopedic surgeon with his family, he was flying on his own uh, airplane and he was crashed to a cornfield and he was brought to a hospital nearby, uh, which is that day standard, the fairly a good, good hospital. Uh, his wife died at the hospital and his children, three children, one had severe injuries, other two had minor injuries. The orthopedic surgeon also had several injuries, <clears throat> but he was witnessing how he was treated. And he realized that the treatment he received is far, far more inferior or substandard than what that hospital could have done with their available facilities. They had enough surgeons, they had enough infrastructure, and they were brought to the hospital very quickly, but they did not get the desired or the optimum treatment because nobody knew what to do, what is best for them. So then he realized that there is something, some gap in carrying out the management. So once he got recovered with this group of friends, he wants to start a trial or set up a pathway to make sure that any trauma per victim, when admitted to a hospital, there should be a clear set pathway that patient should be taken. So that was, that was the beginning of ATLS and in 1978 in Nebraska, they started the first so-called the ATLS program. It's, it was not ATL, but it's a pilot program. During that program, they realized the fantastic achievements they got uh, through that program. So it was recognized by the American College of Surgeons and it was widely spread throughout the America and was revised, reviewed, and it was adapted as a national program. And then it was adapted by the other countries and it went very quickly the, uh, across the globe. And when it spread, it refined and more input from all over the world. And today we have this ATLS program which is uh, carrying out all over the world and I think more than 10 million courses have been done so far this ATLS program. So that was the beginning of what we call today called the ATLS which comprises several steps how to manage a trauma uh, victim when they admitted to a hospital. So the principles behind this ATLS is there are three principles. Treat the greatest threat to the life first. The lack of a definitive diagnosis should never impede the application of an indicated treatment. As an example, 
you think that there is a pneumothorax, but we don't have X-ray. We don't know the diagnosis. So that is a lack of definitive diagnosis. But you know that if it is pneumothorax, what is the treatment? Treatment is ICU. So this lack of uh, confirmation or the definitive diagnosis of IC the pneumothorax should not prevent we inserting an IC tube. So that is what that falls in the second principle. I think first principle is uh, self explanatory because the airway obstruction can kill a person very quicker than the blood loss. So that's why we in the airway first. The third principle is a detailed history is not essential to begin the evaluation of a patient with acute injuries. Uh, from the medical student days, we were emphasized and re-emphasized the importance of history. Uh, that is true and very true when a person comes with a cold problem. When we have enough time to assess this patient, get all the information necessary to begin with the treatment plan. But the trauma patients are totally different. So usually the, the victim or the patient cannot speak for himself. He's too ill or too injured. And there is no body witness. Or if there are witnesses also, they will say different angles of the story. So we can't gather much of a history. And if we try to gather, we will go into more uh, trouble with the history before we start any treatment. So we start the treatment as soon as the patient comes, depending on his evaluation. So with this treatment, with these principles, we, there, there comes another uh, word, triage. I think everybody uh, of you have heard this word. The English meaning of this is that assignment of degree of urgency to injuries to decide the order of treatment of large number of patients or casualties. Actually, the triage is where you get more than one patient. The idea is that they prioritize critical injured based on greatest chance of survival with minimal expenditure of time, resources, and expertise. We will explain this little bit with the next slide. So the triage or the actually the trauma management uh, starts at the scene, scene of the trauma. Uh, in the foreign countries, actually, we have a trauma teams, uh, paramedics uh, who are available like our sewer area. Uh, once it was informed to them, they will go there and uh, manage the patient or the victim at the scene and will brought to the hospital. But since we are very primitive in that sense, we don't have such a team uh, to manage it there. But on the other hand, we are very lucky. We have enough bystanders, enough onlookers who will bring an injured patient to the hospital very quickly. So actually, the uh, what happens in our scenario is actually the pre-hospital management also will be in the hospital because pres patients will be taken to the hospital very quick. They will be evacuated by three will know somebody who are passing by uh, will be taking a patient to an EMB hospital. So that is the pre-hospital and hospital part of the <coughs> trauma management. I will not touch much about the pre-hospital, uh, but we will focus on the hospital management. <coughs> there are three scenarios you can do. Single casualty, multiple casualties, and the mass casualty. The patient whom we were discussing is that it's a single casualty, a one patient who had the injuries and brought to the hospital. So there is no need of triage. He is the sole person and he will be treated. The multiple casualties are where you get uh, more than one injured patient to a hospital. Mass casualty is actually the large number of injured patients. So, difference between multiple casualties and mass casualties are multiple casualties means even though you get large number of patients, your hospital resources 
a adequate to manage this number of patients. So in, in other words, uh, we can tell the NHSL can handle 100 people who are coming to the accident service at one time because our resources are uh, enough for 100 people. So it is a multiple casualty for accident service, NHSL. But if this 100 casualty is admitted to a base hospital, Maravilla, uh, definitely they cannot handle this number of casualties because their resources are much you take So it become a mass casualty for them. So if there is a thousand people coming to the NHSL, so that will be a mass casualty for them because the number of patients who are coming outnumber the resources available. Then we have to think which patient to treat first. So that's why the triage, the word triage is there. Uh, so assignment of degree of urgency to injury is to decide the order of treatment of large number of patients or casualties. And also we want to prioritize which patient will be given the uh, management or the treatment first, depending on the best chance of survival with minimal usage of our resources, means the time, resources, and the expertise, that is doctors. So the triage, there are two categories, triage CU and the triage SOAR. Triage CU is actually a, a, a crude or the basic the method uh, deciding the which patient are stable, which are not stable. So you can see the, the flow chart. Uh, so if they are walking, we tell they don't have much injuries. We put them into green zone. And if they are breathing, <coughs> again, we assess whether the airway is patent or not. <coughs> and the, we go for the respiratory rate and then the circulation. So we decide uh, which way to go. So this is the triage CU. Actually, this is the basic and this usually happens in the pre-hospital or the at the entry to the hospital. The triage sort is a little bit advanced <clears throat> where we have a scoring system and uh, obviously when there's a scoring system you need uh, uh, more personnel to monitor and uh, put into the categories but this is a little bit more accurate than the triage C. Uh, so it, it depends actually the which tool you you use depending on the number of patients and the person who's doing the triage. Triage usually should be done by an experienced, trained person. Suppose uh, if you are the most experienced person in the hospital or the surgeon or SHO, uh, you should be the person who's doing the triage because then you can identify the people who needs the treatment first. Uh, but if somebody else without much experience does this, he might not categorize properly and the, uh, who, who may need the treatment early might not get it uh, as it is. Uh, so the categories are, we label them as the red uh, uh, immediate or the emergency P1, yellow delayed P2, green or walking uh, and minor injuries P3, and the black actually deceased or expectant. So expectant means actually the people who suffered the severe injuries, which we think we can save them in the normal circumstances, but in this situation with the mass casualty or the uh, multiple casualty, if we attend to this patient to save him, it might jeopardize the several of other patients because he will take four or five hours of theater time, uh, one or two surgeons and a lot of other equipments and instruments. So by that time, another two, three patients who are having a less severe injuries and greater chance of survival uh, will die without adequate treatment. 
So, when this patient is admitted, there is a sequence. That is, sequence is the ATLS protocol sequence. So, we start with the primary survey. I think you all know about this primary survey ABCDE uh, protocol. And then we go into resuscitation. Actually, this primary survey and the resuscitation are uh, simultaneous. Even though we describe it uh, one after another, uh, it has to be uh, joined together. And then we have the adjuncts to primary survey and resuscitation. And then we go ahead with the secondary survey and there are adjuncts to the secondary survey and then continued monitoring and re-evaluation and then we will go ahead with the definitive care. So we will take one by one and we will go ahead with the description. Primary survey you should be able to do within 10 seconds. So that's the challenge. If you, if you, I think anybody can do a primary survey if you are given enough time, but the challenge is that you have to do it within very uh, limited time to identify the problems. Uh, the first one is the airway maintenance with cervical spinal protection. So we, even though we call it A, we always uh, describe it as a airway with the cervical spine protection. Uh, breathing and ventilation. Circulation with hemorrhage control. Disability or the neurological status and the exposure and the environmental control. So this will be very quickly assessed and attended in a patient in order to identify his problems and start the treatment quickly. So let's see the resuscitation along with the uh, ABCD. So airway, uh, we first uh, look into the airway whether to see whether the airway is patent. If the patient is producing sound or if the patient is talking, usually the airway is patent. Uh, to make the airway patent, we use two maneuvers, jaw thrust and chin lift. Uh, we don't use the head kit. Uh, usually, the, you, you would have seen the anesthetist uh, do three maneuvers to put the ET tube. When in a trauma patient, in order to protect the cervical spine, we don't do the head tilt, which can uh, extend or the hyperextend the cervical spine, which will damage already injured the spine. And we can insert oropharyngeal airway uh, to keep the tongue falling back. And then if there is any doubt of the patency of the airway, or if you suspect that the patient by his own cannot uh, keep the maintain the airway or is there an immediate threat in another uh, one hour that there is airway um, compromise, better go for a definitive airway with incubation or tracheostomy. So the question which I asked uh, the which I formulated and you have given the answer in the burn patient uh, who had uh, burn surface area of about 35, I think 35 and who's coming with the strido immediately after burn, burn in the face, neck and the upper chest. So with these type of burns, what happens is uh, there is a chance of higher chance of inhalational injury so we have to look into the suit and the, any uh, facial edemas, so on. And the problem with the burns or any upper airway impending obstruction is that once the edema sets in, it's very difficult for us to go and intubate. Even normally also, I think it's difficult to intubate if you are not experienced, but with this type of a patient who with the uh, uh, laryngeal edema or facial edema, it's extremely difficult. So it's always better you put a endotracheal intubation preemptively before the full edema sets in or the, uh, the airway get completely obstructed. And uh, this patient, uh, why not tracheostomy, is that this burn patients, 
if you can achieve endotracheal incubation that's the best and also when there are a lot of burns in the neck and the chest and the face it's very difficult to do tracheostomy because the all the tissues are sold is challenge and tracheostomy is more difficult than the endotracheal intubation but if you cannot do endotracheal intubation yes of course you have to go for a tracheostomy as a life saving procedure so breathing uh, supplementary oxygen via face mask for mask reservoir uh, and uh, we have to quickly go with the ventilation and the release of tension pneumothorax because uh, the case which we discuss we are discussing is that we had the intubation we were he was connected to the ventilator but his saturation was not picking up because uh, of the pneumothorax it was not actually i think ten, not tension pneumothorax is bilateral uh, pneumothorax but because of pneumothorax is considerably large he didn't have enough uh, functional uh, residual capacity in his lungs to have enough uh, oxygenation so actually it's a intervention resuscitation intervention uh, go in hand and hand to secure his uh, breathing uh, next is the circulation and the bleeding control obviously the any external bleeders you would con control then and there we don't use the turning case now but we use the direct pressure with some gauze or whatever the cloth is available we put the direct pressure to control the bleeding and even the hospital setup and if you can see a artery or vein is bleeding uh, you can put a clamp ideally it should be a vascular clamp but if vascular clamp is not available don't hesitate to put a, uh, any clamp to save his life but then we can remove that uh, crush part and anastomos and iv access is very important uh, two white bow cannulas uh, actually the we don't mind the size of the vein because the rate to which we infuse fluid depending on the uh, diameter of the cannula or the catheter we insert uh, larger the uh, diameter uh, higher the rate which we can infuse and also it is inversely related to the length if the length is more slower it goes so short wide bow cannulas are best uh, for resuscitation uh, intravenous fluid earlier we used to give 1 liter 2 liter 3 liter but nowadays the practice is that uh, you don't give much because of the hemodilution which in turn again reduce oxygen carrying capacity instead we give uh, one liter very quickly and by the time uh, we make sure that blood is available blood transfusion uh, so this patient also had the one liter of uh, saline quickly along with the uncross match uh, blood uh, but group specific if the group specific blood is not available we can give o negative blood uh, to for resuscitation and uh, the important thing i want to highlight in this case is that even with this amount so 1 liter and almost uh, 1.5 liters patient had given and he is not picking up his blood pressure is still dropping so that means there is something uh, somewhere something is leaking so it's like uh, you are pouring water to a can where there is a hole so however much you put it won't retain it will go out uh, so you have to remember this aggressive and continued volume resuscitation is not a substitute for definitive hemorrhage control uh, in this uh, questionnaire also there was a one question that uh, I think patient had following road traffic accident. Uh, he was uh, dropping blood, and what are the best uh, option? It is actually the, the blood transfusion and the laparotomy. 
because if you take to the ICU and research state, the research station is better in the ICU and at the hands of anesthetist. But until you close the uh, hole, whatever we are giving, it will not retain, but then it will lead to a massive, trans massive blood transfusion and uh, another different set of problems uh, uh, for the patient. So always think that, as I said earlier, unexplained or hypotension in a trauma victim, unless proven otherwise, it is due to uh, blood loss. So adjuncts to primary survey and resuscitation. Uh, so there, there is several people asking whether I can do this during the primary CL survey or not. But as I said that within 10 seconds, if you are going to do the primary survey and the, these resuscitative steps, uh, along with that, there is hardly any time for adjuncts to do. So because of that, actually we keep them later or else unless you have another person in hand two three people if you can attend then somebody can do these things so pulse oximeter actually it's very very helpful uh, and the blood pressure monitoring ecg monitoring now we have the multiple monitoring which uh, is combinations and the urinary catheterization and uh, make sure that the the patient is not having a pelvic injury or the high riding prostate or the blood at the meters. Uh, so these actually will lead to false passage or the false track formation with the catheterization. In that case, as in the question which I have asked, that patient who has the uh, palpable bladder and the blood at the meters, uh, our option is to go for a suprapubic catheterization. So this patient, we can go urinary catheterization, arterial blood gas, if it is available in the bedside, and the X-ray chest and pelvis AP, because the PA we can't do, because you can't move the patient. Uh, these will be done with the portable uh, X-ray machines, and the uh, X-ray chest and pelvis, and if indicated, you can do a, if really needed, can do a C cervical spine lateral, but the problem is that the, the uh, value of these X-ray films, when you do with the portable X-ray machine in the bedside, uh, we can't interpret that because it might not include the whole cervical spine. So it will usually take the middle part. So you are nowhere whether you can exclude the injury or whether you have to protect. So it's you, sometimes it's better not to take the X-ray and assume that this patient has a cervical spinal injury until you get the definitive radiological investigations and confirm it. And this, uh, our patient, he, what happened was uh, he uh, did not have any X-rays to confirm his uh, uh, pneumothorax but he had the uh, IC tubes and since his blood pressure was dropping uh, with the one pint uh, of blood transfusion and another pint on the way he was taken to the theater for exploratory laparotomy and that uh, picture I think you, you can see we have put a uh, pelvic binder not a commercially available one but improvised one we get a bed sheet uh, roll it into a, a small rope like thing and tied to control the uh, pelvic bleeds because we don't know whether there is a pelvic fracture or not but it's always better to stabilize the pelvis because uh, retroperitoneal hematoma is one of the greatest silent killers because we don't appreciate the amount of blood which can be bled into the retroperitoneal space usually the uh, without much evidence in the outside a calf in an adult patient, calf can contain one liter of blood. So tibia fibula fracture uh, can bleed up to one liter into the calf without significant swelling and two liters in the thigh. So this patient had the thigh uh, swelling, but there was no clinical uh, features of uh, fracture. 
uh, but he can have crush injury and can bleed lot and also pelvis uh, which can contain at least three liters so it's more than half of the blood volume and of course intra abdominal it's any amount as long as you give blood it will contain in the abdomen uh, whatever you give so there is no way you can uh, stop uh, uh, the bleeding intra abdominal unless you surgically stop it <clears throat> so once you finish the primary survey <clears throat> you go to the secondary survey but secondary survey does not begin until the primary survey is completed and the resuscitation efforts are also underway and normalization of vital function has been demonstrated uh, so this patient actually we didn't go for a secondary survey because we could not complete uh, his uh, primary survey and the resuscitation. Uh, so he is underway his resuscitation. We, we don't know his brain, whether he had the uh, injury inside the brain or anywhere. We don't know about the other fractures. Uh, but still under the CO circulation and hemorrhage control, uh, we have to act to save his life and to take him to the theatre uh, in between. Uh, but at any time during secondary survey, suppose this patient gets stabilized and you uh, plan to do a secondary survey and during the secondary survey, if you find the features of uh, deterioration, uh, you go back again to the primary survey, start from the airway, breathing, circulation, so on. On the second survey uh, continued, uh, we see in the second survey, we have to get a history. Uh, we call detailed history, but it's very difficult to get a detailed history in a trauma patient because usually uh, there is no relatives, no bystanders, and the uh, person who would have handed over to the patient would have vanished by the time you start the secondary survey. Uh, so as a matter of fact, we use this ample history. A is for uh, allergies, uh, M is for medication, if we know, uh, P is for past medical history and the histories of pregnancies, uh, L is for last meal, is for events and the environment. So in the E, under the E, you can go ahead with uh, asking the uh, scenario, what has happened? Because uh, even though we started the treatment plan without knowing what has happened actually, by knowing the uh, scenario or the uh, exact events took place during the injury, it helps us to plan our management and the suspect in a greater degree that the injuries the patient would have uh, had. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, ample history and then you go ahead with the head to toe evaluation. So actually uh, it has to be the patient has to be undressed. You can cover in a, <coughs> sorry bed, uh, bed linen and then uh, you go ahead with the examining the patient from one end to the other end in a methodical way, not to miss any injuries, because that is very important because sometimes we take the patient to theater for something and without knowing the other injuries, then the, when the patient comes back next day morning, when we do the ward round, we find there is another laceration in the back of the chest. So he will be taken to theater again. So that adds more trauma, more surgery means more trauma actually that surgery is also trauma it's it's equivalent to a road traffic accident in the minor degree uh, each region of the body is completely uh, examined and the complete neurological examination will be uh, performed and the neuro under the neurological examination we have to assess the glasgow coma scale and the pupil sizes and reactions and the localizing and the lateralizing side that means the neurological status of the body. <coughs> and the, <coughs> earlier we discussed about the sequence, it's the same slide, and now we have covered the primary survey, uh, resuscitation, 
adjusts to primary survey and station and the second survey. Once you finish the second survey, we go to the adjuncts to the second survey. <coughs> what are the adjuncts to the second survey? Are the <coughs> CT scan, uh, contrast CT scan, MCCT brain, urethrograms, um, and uh, angiograms, those kind of hi fi stuff you can go, even the ultrasound scan. Uh, but fast comes with the uh, adjunct to the primary survey when you are not sure whether to open this abdomen or not then you can do fast but if you think that there is a bleed in the abdomen and his abdomen is swelling he is getting unstable never wait for the fast you go ahead with the treatment the fast is that that you are not sure whether you are going to open this abdomen or not, then you can go with the fast. But nowadays in NHSL, we have enough uh, trained uh, people at the, our room, so they will by simultaneously will do fast in the NHSL, but in the other places where the patient will be admitted to a and &E and the unit the person comes from the radiology department to do the fast, better not to do the fast by that time you can take to the patient to theater and do the laparotomy and arrest the bleeding and never hesitate about the negative laparotomy uh, in trauma uh, the because at least by doing the negative the negative laparotomy means you do the laparotomy and you don't find any bleed or anything but at least that gives a valuable information that there is nothing in the abdomen if the patient is deteriorating, you are sure that you don't have to do anything with the abdomen, that you have to concentrate on the other areas of his body uh, for his deterioration. Uh, so we were discussing about adjuncts to the secondary survey. And the most important thing is, is that a continued monitoring and re-evaluation. Because these uh, trauma patients are very dynamic. Sometimes they might be we'll categorize in the, in the triage that they as the P3 or the green, but in 10 minutes time, they become P1. Uh, because especially the young people who are in the reservoir and the strength to withstand the trauma with major injuries, they will collapse suddenly. So, so never underestimate that your patient can go bad and don't get it personally that if you, make that patient a, a stable patient and the next 10 minutes you find him is crashing down but the important thing is that you make sure that there is a uh, monitoring and the evaluation and the re-evaluation to pick up these uh, people <clears throat> and then you can go with the definitive care like the fixations orthopedic management uh, or the other management of this patient uh, so this is actually the CT scan which we took uh, next day morning of that patient after laparotomy. So what happened in the laparotomy was there was a uh, large retroperitoneal hematoma and actually the active uh, liver laceration which is actively bleeding uh, which actually he didn't have any uh, bruising or anything in his right uh, hypochondrium but uh, anyhow he has got the uh, liver laceration so we could not control the bleeding and we had to pack it uh, with uh, four large packs uh, and the close the abdomen and send him to the ICU and the next day only we got down this CT which shows that the, the severe injuries uh, he sustained uh, his pelvic fracture in three places, this side and this side also severely fractured here and here. And uh, this ileum got fractured and this area also, there's a dehiscence and this side also. So he had uh, severe uh, fractures and also we were unable to pass a, a urinary catheter. Uh, in the R room we tried, we could not and then uh, on table also we tried but it was not going we didn't force uh, since his bladder was palpable during the we can see the bladder during the laparotomy we put a suprapubic uh, catheter per op and he's awaiting 
uh, pelvic fixations and so on after the pack removal. So there are uh, other few x-rays which I thought uh, might uh, uh, good for you to find out what's going on. This is, this is the uh, chest x-ray which I am showing the right side just to show the pneumothorax. This is the lung margin which I am tracing. So unless your eyes are not trained, it's difficult to find out this margin. So you can see the lung markings here, lung marking comes up to here and it stops there. So this is the lung margin and here is the air in the plural space. And as we described, discussed about the <coughs> spinal injuries, so this is the thoracic spinal injury, which collapses of the anterior column, but the posterior column is intact. And you can see the spinal cord is fairly okay. This patient does not have any neurology. And the, this patient, you can see the same type of injury, but it's collapsed more and this posterior segment has gone back. So actually this patient also does not have any neurology. Uh, lucky for him, but if we don't uh, manage him properly, soon he will get. If he moves here and there, at any time this rectopulse segment will compress the spinal cord and uh, cause uh, spinal cord damage. Uh, so any patient who are suspicious of uh, cervical spinal trauma, especially the trauma to head and neck uh, or the upper chest, we have to assume that these patients are having uh, cervical spinal injuries. And our idea is to protect the cervical spine uh, to prevent the secondary injuries. The primary injury, if the patient has had the primary uh, cervical cord injury, you can't do much about that except uh, you fix it for prevent further damage. But if the patient is uh, uh, not having uh, injury, uh, you can prevent him getting uh, paralyzed. And trauma is actually is uh, challenging, challenging in the sense the time wise. It's in a very quick time you have to uh, identify what is going on, and you have to institute your treatment and get the in relevant investigations uh, which is necessary. So for that you need a lot of great degree of preparation preparation by failing to prepare you are preparing to fail. This is by Benjamin Franklin. Franklin, I know he's a, a scientist, a scholar, and he is the one who invented the bifocal spectacles. And he was considered as the one of the fathers of America. And by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So the preparation is actually, I, I would say it's a two way. One way is that the, uh, we get prepared. How we get prepared is we have to learn how to manage the trauma. We have to read, but reading is not enough. We have to practice. How do you practice? Uh, one way is practicing is you go to the a &E and do the practices. Or the best way is to you follow ATLS uh, courses. Actually, this. This is the overview of trauma, initial management of trauma to arose you the, the facts about trauma management. Uh, but the most important thing or the most refined, the practical aspects uh, you have to cover from a, a course, ATLS courses, which are conducted periodically in Sri Lanka. And the next preparation is that you prepare where your patient is going to get treated. That is the a and &E or the accident service or the R room, whatever the place, you make sure every day the necessary equipments are there and uh, your staff is also well aware what you are going to do. And then it's, it's actually a teamwork. 
uh, a single person cannot handle a trauma victim so it has to be a uh, teamwork so you get prepared and you prepare others as well as the infrastructure right so i think uh, that's the end of our presentation uh, i think if you have any questions we can uh, go ahead with the questions Um, thank you very much, sir, for that very informative presentation. I think we have a few queries. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what's the platinum 10 minutes in trauma? Mm, platinum 10 minutes is actually the... Uh, yeah, earlier it was called the golden hour. Uh, but now, since this, uh, all the marketing people, they introduced platinum over the gold, uh, it becomes the most crucial 10 minutes uh, following trauma. Actually, that crucial 10 minutes following trauma is soon after the trauma. But we don't get the victim soon after the trauma. But we count that platinum 10 minutes from the admission to the hospital and afterwards 10 minutes. So that is actually within the golden hour, as I said, that within 10 seconds, you have to assess the patient and then start the session, then decide what to do. Actually, this, this patient uh, whom I was discussing, within 10 minutes, he was in the theater table. And actually he got arrested. His first arrest was on the theater table with the consultant anesthetist. He was resuscitated successfully, but suppose it happened uh, beforehand, I don't think he will survive. So that's the importance of uh, the time in trauma. Uh, what is damage control resuscitation and damage control surgery? Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a good, uh, good question. Uh, actually, the, what we did this patient is the damage control surgery. What the anesthetist did was a damage control resuscitation. Actually, the we resuscitation word means we resuscitate the patient fully, make sure he is stable. Surgery, when we do the surgery, we make sure that his all injuries are attended. But in trauma, if we are going to do the resuscitation for a long time, it will delay the surgery. But other way around, if we are going to do the definitive surgery for a long time, the patient will collapse and die. So this both resuscitation and the trauma should go hand in hand. So because of that, what we do is we give uh, fluid and the blood and we resuscitate him to make sure that he can stand the surgery. Then we take him to the surgery, but we didn't attempt to control the liver bleeding or suturing or any, any big things. What we did was we quickly packed because patient blood pressure was dropping. And if we take little more time, he would have crashed out. So we quickly pack the liver, make sure no other injuries, and we pack the pelvis to uh, control the pelvic bleeders and put the supravivic catheter, closed and came out. That is actually the damage control surgery. So after 24 or 48 or 72 hours, we can go ahead and we can do the uh, another loop and uh, do whatever the necessary surgery once the patient is more stable. After how many blood pints are we deciding to go for a laparotomy in solid abdominal organ injury without managing conservatively? Uh, there is no as such the blood number of blood pints. Uh, and there is no conservative management also in solid organ injury. Suppose the patient is stable enough uh, not to go to theater, then we can do a CT scan, which, which is in the secondary survey, then we can ascertain whether these, uh, there are gradings of liver laceration, screen laceration, and so on. We can say grade one, grade two, grade three, four, five. But in the earlier grades, which we, we think that patient is not deteriorating, 
uh, we can manage conservatively, but if the patient is needing blood, and then it may be one point or sometimes without any blood point, we might go ahead with the surgery to control the bleed. And also my advice is to, and if you are hesitant, whether to go ahead or not with the laparotomy, it's better go ahead with the laparotomy. Uh, what is the place for hypertonic saline in trauma resuscitation, damage control resuscitation? Hypertonic saline, uh, actually, I also don't know. We haven't, we have never used hypertonic saline in uh, resuscitation. Uh, so we use normal saline and can use heart means. And, but more emphasis is going on for the blood products. Hypertonic, I have never come across. I don't know whether it's used or not. In initial resuscitation, after how many fluid amount are we deciding whether the patient is fluid responsive or non-responsive? It's one liter. Uh, can you please repeat ample? Ample is uh, A is allergies, M is medication, uh, P is past medical history and the pregnancies, L is last meal, E is events and the environment. How long do we have to keep the patient with unstable wedge fracture in spinal board or bed rest? Uh, actually, we uh, uh, we don't keep the patients on spinal boards for a long time because our idea of the spinal board is the stabilization of the patient for transportation. So as soon as the, our transportation, whatever the need is uh, fulfilled, we have to keep him on a bed because spinal boards are not meant for the long-term stay and they are very rigid. And actually, they can start because usually these people are uh, neuropathic. They have lack of sensation and very quickly they can start bed so So we don't advise to keep them for a long time on the, on the uh, spinal boards. Second thing is that the, uh, if there is a fracture or something needs fixation, earlier the better. So even the patient is quadriplegic with the cervical spinal fracture, if you fix early, we can start the rehabilitation early. And if you start the rehabilitation early, his long-term outcome will be much, much better than delayed fixation and delayed rehabilitation. So that too. And the uh, bed rest is until he gets fixed or his fracture gets stabilized, we have to keep him bed rest. Otherwise, we have to mobilize him as soon as possible. What are the indications for bilateral thoracotomy? Uh, there are no indications for bilateral thoracotomy per se. Uh, the only place where we go ahead with that, first we go ahead with the ICU tubes and we found that the uh, hemothorax, which is bleeding massively, or once we put if it draining more than a uh, thousand, uh, we can't say it's a bilateral, actually, it's one side or either side or both sides. It can be like that. And if it is draining continuously, usually the, the book says that uh, if you get uh, 100 to 150 ml per hour, uh, consecutive two hours, you can go ahead with uh, sorry, thoracotomy. But it's actually the clinical judgment more important and the expertise available, uh, go ahead with the thoracotomy and arrest the bleeding. Can we use tetra starch to pick up BP until blood is available? Uh, heta starch, now we don't use at all. Colloids we don't use in trauma resuscitation. Uh, how to perform a tracheostomy? <laughs> yeah, that's actually a surgical, a surgical topic. Uh, the easiest way is that in an emergency, uh, you have to cut in between the uh, thyroid cartilage and the, the sternal notch. 
and whatever the way you like you can cut and uh, you can identify the trachea yeah, deepen it and put at least a, a empty empty pen uh, the the barrel of a pen you can remove all the inside of a pen and you at least you put it will save the life uh, but the proper way of doing a tracheostomy it actually it's inside the theater it's a, a surgical topic but you can do a cricothyroidectomy or the needle cricothyroidectomy uh, by putting a white bone needle under the uh, thyroid cartilage to make sure that he survives until the patient will be taken for a tracheostomy. How to manage open pneumothorax? Uh, yeah, open pneumothorax. You can make a Actually, the pneumothorax, we, uh, we, by putting ICO tube, we make it connect to outside and it make a controlled open pneumothorax. But suppose I think the question is that there is a large wound and which sucks air in and out. This means uh, you can't keep that hole as it is. We have to uh, close it with the sutures if possible. If there is no sutures available, uh, we can put a ghost pack and close it. At, but at the same time, we have to put IC tube to take out the remaining air from the pleural cavity. Uh, last question for the day, sir. How to manage posterior epistaxis in traumatic patient? Posterior epistaxis, that is uh, the bleeding to the posterior part of the nasopharynx. Yeah. That is actually we refer to ENT, uh, we do the packing, uh, we can do the ad, uh, adrenaline packs uh, to the nose as a temporary measure. What you can do is bilateral nostrils, we can uh, adrenaline soak packs will be inserted uh, until the bleeding get arrested. But if the bleeding is not get arrested, as soon as you have to get the ENT opinion. Um, if there are no more queries, I would like to thank Dr. H.R. Thambavite, Consultant General Surgeon from Accident Service National Hospital of Sri Lanka for his excellent presentation on behalf of GMOA Sri Knowledge Academy. Thank you very much, sir. So here we are signing off today. Have a good week. See you next week. Thank you very much.